Coming up, find out how and why turbochargers blow in the manner of a nymphomaniac on crack, thereby increasing internal combustion engine efficiency. Welcome to another What The Fact. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Aussie new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Now, it's self-evident that adding a turbocharger to a modern engine does increase efficiency because all the manufacturers are doing it. And they're generally not doing it to build some fire-breathing, tyre-shredding monster. Although, you know, you can absolutely achieve that via the high-tech miracle of turbocharging, if that is your engineering want. More and more car makers are doing it, however, on small to tiny engines. Hyundai Kia's 1.6, Renault Nissan's 1.2, Volkswagen's 1.4, and Honda's 1.5, etc. First up, when you add a turbo in concert with direct injection, you generally get a nice flat torque curve from something like 1500 RPM up to 4500, and that delivers pleasantly rewarding constant thrust at wide open throttle across that range. Diesel-like mid-RPM power, right there. Yes! Very strong down low, said the aspiring actress to Bill Cosby. Now please take the handcuffs off and let me go back to my parents. It is, after all, a school night. But now, to efficiency. Here's a typical question from Adam Kondik. You're an engineer, I'm not even close. Please tell me how a turbo increases thermal efficiency. I understand modern turbo engines have similar compression ratios to non-turbo engines, but in real-world driving, not scientific, I know, but my old man reckons his FG 4-litre was better on fuel than his EcoBoost. Leaving the paternal petrol-sipping proclivities to one side momentarily, turbochargers increase both volumetric and thermal efficiency of an engine. But let's back up and review exactly what turbochargers are. A turbocharger is what you get when you connect two fans to the same shaft. You drive one of the fans with hot exhaust gas and you use that impetus to compress inlet air using the other fan. So basically you use energy that would have been wasted in exhaust gas rushing out the pipe to jam more air into the engine than it would be able to suck on its own. More air in the combustion chamber allows more fuel to be burned. Happy days. That's volumetric efficiency. A smaller turbo engine doing the same job as a larger Atmo engine. And of course, you get more thermal efficiency because energy that would have been wasted in the exhaust flow and essentially lost forever is now doing useful work for the engine vis-a-vis -vis jamming extra air in on the inlet side. When people learn four-stroke engine basics, they get taught inlet, compression, ignition, and exhaust, right? But I prefer suck, squeeze, bang, and blow. It's a character flaw, but I like it. Suck and blow are clearly the most enjoyable here, not to mention oddly pertinent to our discussion. The turbo gives the inlet air plumbing a suck assist as discussed, and it gets that assist from the blow stroke. So once again, we see another example of sucking and blowing, working together and making life even better. When you drill down into engine operation, a lot of people get the mistaken notion in their heads that the upwards motion of the piston is what actually pumps the exhaust gas out of the engine, like the proverbial bicycle pump, only hotter and quite a lot faster. As nice as this idea is, it's pretty much bullshit. That's not what actually happens. The engine goes bang, the fuel-air mixture ignites. People think it explodes, but it really just burns fast. This causes the rapid energetic expansion of the gas mixture in the chamber. It pushes the piston down hard, and that is where the useful work from the engine comes from. But then, some short time before the piston gets to the bottom of the bore, the exhaust valve opens and what actually evacuates most of the exhaust gas 
is its own rapid expansion. Autoerotic exfiltration, it literally ejects itself out the exhaust port without waiting around to be asked to leave by the piston. Of course, I can see how one might think that's a waste, because you might think even more useful work could be extracted by the piston by opening the exhaust valve a little later. But in reality, then the piston would need to do quite a bit more pumping and any benefit from opening later would be frittered away. Engines already experience pumping losses and they really don't need any more of that. There's a lot of energy in exhaust gas too, especially at big throttle openings and 1500 plus RPM. Exhaust flow is pretty gentle at idle, which is where most people commonly observe and experience it but it's actually quite energetic when the engine is doing its thing in anger. And it's that inherent energeticness that the turbocharger capitalises on when it does its fine work. In the olden days, 20 years ago, before the advent of Twitter, but significantly after the death of the dinosaurs, turbocharging was all about performance. And I can see how an old fart such as myself, only who never went to engineering school, might struggle with the link between efficiency and turbocharging, but it certainly is there. Turbocharging in ordinary cars is all about efficiency as manufacturers struggle to hit their strict fuel economy targets. Of course, there are secondary efficiency benefits in play here as well. A smaller engine doing a bigger engine's job has less mass, so there's less baggage to haul around. There's less internal resistance as well by virtue of being smaller, and it generally does its thing at lower revs, reducing internal resistance even further. So that's a plus. Doing more with less. An excellent way to get a bunch of engineers rock hard, yes! We're talking 69 Rockwell C minimum. The Canadian government says the consumption benefit from turbocharging a modern engine is 2 to 6%, depending on the calibre of the underlying engineering. What we're actually seeing with modern petrol engines is a convergence with diesel engine combustion control. Two out of the three boxes are already ticked. Turbocharging plus direct injection. The final hurdle, the third box, is compression ignition, which is under development but still some time off. But it will be a happy day for efficiency when that arrives, so stand by for that. On this glorious day, we will see one litre compression ignition turbocharged petrol engines doing what two litre Atmo petrol engines do routinely today and the non-existent Christian God will say that it is good. Of course, there are some downsides to turbocharging. Feedback effects, if you like. Turbos run hot and they rotate really fast. And this places extreme demands on the lubricating oil. So it's a very bad idea indeed to scrimp on the maintenance and servicing of a turbocharged engine. Unless you actually want a small pile of titanium alloy shrapnel for the mantelpiece and of course a bill that you can't jump over. A turbocharger failure can be very expensive to repair. Of course, these installations also place severe demands on the engineers developing them. And some companies do it better than others. Down the track with 100,000 Ks on the clock and a blown turbo on your hands, looking at a hefty five-figure repair bill, it can be utterly galling to learn that you are not alone here because a car maker could have done its job a whole lot better. In some cases, really better. So it pays to do your research, especially if buying a used turbocharged car. And now, some insightful feedback from you. Jordi S offers the following deep and meaningful contribution to the program. John, you can't honestly believe the Americans invented inbreeding. The monarchs of Europe were all related and still intermarrying for centuries before America was even Founded. Very true, Geordie, and thank you very much. I stand corrected. You Americans did not invent inbreeding. You democratised it. 
for the masses. And what a gift it was up on Walton Mountain. Jim Bob, Mary Ellen, Mary Ellen, Jim Bob. It's quite okay. European royalty's been added for centuries, and now you can too. It's simply shameful, a blight on the human spirit, to learn that once the joy of inbreeding was reserved only for aristocratic European assholes. So thank you, Mirica, for striking this powerful blow for equality, yes, in a purely thermodynamic sense, of course. I'm John Cadogan, the world's most incorrigible applied physics tutor. I hope this helps. Thanks for watching. 